Melbourne Victory could lose competition points after four flares were set off at last night's Melbourne Derby. Three people were arrested and another 13 were evicted from the match at Etihad Stadium. One flare was lit during the second half of the match against Melbourne City. The others were set off outside the stadium. Police say they're happy with the overall behaviour of 43,000 spectators but disappointed by a few. The fan who lit the flare inside the stadium will be charged. Marcus Papadopoulos, publisher and editor of Politics First, joins us. So, Hedo Alabadi talking there, and we know they're engaged in a war of words with Turkey. Uh, so the basic question is, uh, what is Turkey doing there? What plans do they have when it comes, especially uh, at this point in phase, regarding Mosul? Well, the situation that Iraq finds itself in today is diabolical. On the one hand, Iraq is trying to free itself of the cancer that is ISIS. On the other hand, however, that fight against ISIS is being undermined by both Turkey and Saudi Arabia. And Turkey and Saudi Arabia have long been supporting ISIS with weapons, with money, and with logistical support. And now it's necessary to examine the motives in more depth as to why uh, Riyadh and Ankara are interfering in the Iraqi government's fight against ISIS. If we can take the Saudis first of all, we can say that Saudi Arabia is uh, very annoyed, very frustrated, very concerned about the good relations, the excellent relations in fact, which exist between Baghdad and Tehran. And of course uh, Saudi Arabia despises Iran. Saudi Arabia wants to uh, destroy uh, Iran, um, I, I think uh, figuratively speaking, but also perhaps uh, literally speaking. So the Saudis are, cry are trying to disrupt the good relations between Iran and Iraq. Now, if we, have, if we take Turkey, I would say Turkey's motives for undermining Iraq's fight against ISIS are even more sinister than the Saudis because the Turks, once again, have a very close relationship uh, with ISIS and that includes President Erdogan's family who have been buying oil uh, from ISIS. But why is the Turkish army um, intent on uh, playing a part in the, in the Iraqi army's attempt to liberate Mosul from ISIS? Well, this is a theory which I'm going to put forward, but I think it's a uh, distinct possibility. We have heard reports this week cited by Russian officials that the Americans and the Saudis are making plans for ISIS fighters to withdraw from Mosul and to go into Syria. Now that makes sense uh, from an American perspective and from a Saudi perspective because they need ISIS fighters in Syria to try and disrupt uh, the Syrian army's campaign of liberating uh, Syrian territory. And the role of the Turkish army could be to allow uh, to give safe passage to ISIS fighters leaving Mosul. Now, as I said, that is just a theory, but I'm, uh, I'm quite uh, willing uh, to say that publicly. And as I said, I believe that is a very distinct possibility. Well, your theory is somewhat backed uh, and uh, voiced by uh, the Hezbollah Secretary General, Said Hassan Nasrallah, who said that these uh, ISIL leaders are going to be leaving Mosul and going into eastern Aleppo and that that is uh, what the plan is. And, of course, you're saying that Turkey perhaps is going to give them cover of some kind. Uh, so if they're going to do that, uh, it comes back to uh, are they thinking that they're going to now fight against the Syrian army and Russia, but then they're going to need some kind of cover, aren't they? So uh, where does that leave the um, military uh, agenda for the U.S. and its allies? Well, let's take Aleppo. Why is the West... Uh, so now concerned, in inverted commas, about Aleppo. It hasn't been concerned about uh, Aleppo uh, for the last uh, four years or so. They haven't been concerned about how the terrorists, the Islamist terrorists in those occupied parts of Aleppo have been shelling and mortaring uh, Syrian civilians in government-controlled parts of Aleppo and killing them every day. They haven't been concerned about how the terrorists in Aleppo have been cutting off water supplies to the government parts of Aleppo, cutting off electricity and gas. The real reason as to why the West is so concerned about Aleppo is that it could be, and I emphasize it could be, a turning point in the Syrian conflict. If the Syrian army can liberate 
uh, those parts of Aleppo controlled by Islamist terrorists, then, as I said, it could be a, it could be a turning point uh, politically um, and also militarily. Now, uh, the West and its regional allies, Turkey and Saudi Arabia, they need as many forces as possible to try and disrupt the Syrian army's campaign uh, in Aleppo. And how do you do that? By playing one of their trump cards, which of course is ISIS. And uh, there are many, many ISIS fighters in Mosul, and they are very well armed. And however much I loathe ISIS, they are fanatical fighters. They are very effective fighters. They're not scared of dying, and that makes them a formidable force. So if those ISIS fighters can leave Mosul uh, and enter Syria and go to Aleppo under Turkish cover, then that could be, uh, uh, in theory, a threat to the Syrian army. So I said at the beginning of this interview that Iraq finds itself in a diabolical situation, and also, of course, Syria finds itself in a diabolical situation. Both countries are fighting the scourge of Islamist terrorism, terrorism which threatens not just those two countries, not just the Middle East, not just the Muslim world, but the whole world. And yet you have big players in the world, America, Britain, Turkey and Saudi Arabia, who are doing their utmost to try and disrupt, to try and derail the campaign of the Iraqi military and the Syrian military to neutralize this terrible, terrible threat that is Islamist terrorism. Thank you, Marcus Papadopoulos, publisher and editor of Politics First. Mr. Mike Harris, who is the editor of Veterans Day, and he's joining us live now by Skype from Oregon. Mr. Harris, uh, Turkey insists on being part of this, this Mosul operation. Um, why do you think that is? Well, um, boy, I, I think uh, Turkey is trying to infringe upon Iraq's sovereignty. Iraq has been through some very, very tough times uh, since the first Gulf War uh, instituted by George H.W. Bush, and uh, it, it's not gotten much better. Uh, I think Turkey is looking to capitalize on uh, um, Iraqi uh, sovereignty and Iraqi territory uh, while they can, uh, because Iraq has not uh, mended itself, it's not fully healed from uh, the trauma it's been put through uh, by the U.S. and its allies, and I think Turkey is, is looking to capitalize upon that. And of course, uh, I would imagine the U.S. role here is important. Um, I had read a statement, I think, a while back, or a few days back, or maybe it was yesterday, about the United States saying that Turkey should respect Iraqi sovereignty. Do you think that the United States stands with Iraq on this? Well, I hope they do. Uh, but, you know, I, I look at the, the history that Turkey has. Uh, they're responsible for the Armenian genocide. They've been very active uh, with supporting the uh, ISIS al-Nusra Daesh terrorists in Syria. I, I just don't think Turkey is to be trusted. Uh, they, they have not proven themselves to be a good neighbor uh, in the region. They've been very, very opportunistic. And uh, I think they're, they're looking to... Uh, you know, uh, well, they, they have the issue with the Kurds that they've been uh, fighting for years. That, that's, their, their, that's Turkey's next uh, set of victims there, is, is the Kurdish population. But I, I'm just, uh, I just am very suspect of anything Turkey does. I do not trust them. Uh, they are not conducting themselves as a legitimate uh, democracy. Uh, Erdogan has uh, stepped in. He's more like Emperor Erdogan these days. And I just don't know what this guy's plans are. I am very, very skeptical of anything that this uh, uh, that the Turkish government would do at this point in time. But I would imagine, Mr. Harris, that Turkey has on its side, of course, the Kurdistan regional government, A, and B, the likes of the Saudis, who are very against the popular mobilization units who have been fighting against Daesh within Iraq. Um, uh, how do you think that support then maybe changes the dynamics of well, the Well, I, I, don't, I don't see anything from Saudi Arabia uh, fighting Daesh in Iraq at all. I see the Saudis as suppliers to Daesh uh, in Iraq and Syria. I, I, I don't see them uh, you know, uh, offering any resistance uh, there. I, I think that's a mistake. Statement. No, I mean, I mean, Mr. Harris, that uh, Saudi Arabia would support Turkey and, and Turkey obviously criticizing the Iraqis constantly over the likes of their future operations in Mosul. Well, look, I, I think Turkey um, needs to butt out. I think that the Iraqis need to handle this on their own uh, with, with support they invite into the country, not, uh, not support that is imposed upon them. Uh, I think that the Iraqis will come out of this. I, I, I am confident that they will. And I really think that Iraq needs to get its, uh, 
get its own sovereignty back, get its own uh, sense of self back, uh, of nationhood back. And I think having all these outsiders intervening in their country uh, prevents them from doing that. That's more of an obstacle to, uh, to Iraq becoming the free and sovereign Iraq it needs to be. Very well. We'll leave it there at that point, Mr. Harris. But of course, as always, we appreciate you taking your time to speak to us. Now to the miracle recovery of a Perth man injured in a crash that killed his parents moments after a police pursuit. Michael was this week discharged from intensive care and is undergoing rehabilitation. He's told the West Australian he believes police should continue pursuits and doesn't blame them for the deaths of parents Kevin and Glennis. Officers had aborted the pursuit last month when a car sped off and T-boned Michael's vehicle. He's now facing a long recovery. Details of how you can help are on the 7 News Perth Facebook page. A 16-year-old has been charged over the crash. Following breaking news out of Amherst where two people were shot early this morning, 22 News reporter Rachel Fazio joins us live in Amherst with the latest details on that shooting. Police say two people were shot early this morning here at 266 East Hadley Road. Amherst police were first sent to the apartment complex and townhouse when shots were fired just after midnight. When our 22 News crews got there, police were taping off the area and looking for evidence. There's still heavy police presence hours after the shooting took place. I just came out to walk the dogs this morning and then saw all the police tape uh, and then the German shepherds looking for something, so that, that's a little disconcerting when you wake up. Sergeant Brian Johnson told 22 News two people were shot but cannot confirm where they were taken for treatment. The condition of the two victims is not known at this time. Sergeant Johnson said police are expected to release more information on the victims later this morning. Police have now been here for over nine hours. They have taped off a large perimeter around where the shooting took place and are using German Shepherd dogs to help with their investigation. 22 News has called Amherst Police, but they are not releasing any additional information at this time. We will continue to keep you updated as information becomes available, both on air and online at WWLP.com. Live in Amherst, Rachel Fazio, 22 News. How long do you think this battle will, will take to recapture Mosul? Well, the, uh, the operation in Mosul will be, in my assessment, more difficult because the enemy's been there for you know, two years. You're saying that ISIS leaders are fleeing the city, is that right? They're, we are get indications that they are leaving. Do you expect that some ISIS fighters will fight to the death? Well, we, we expect the foreign fighters that are there, they'll have a real difficult time trying to blend in with a population of folks that want to move out of Mosul. And so we expect that they'll, they'll be the ones that, that would fight the hardest, as we've seen in a number of the other fights. But, you know, they won't succeed. What role are U.S. service members going to play in this battle? Well, we really do three things here primarily. The first is enable Iraqi maneuver through, you know, what we call lethal strikes from air and ground. Uh, we advise and assist at really the division and operational command level and at the brigade as required. And then we train. We run all of the training for the Iraqi brigades who are getting ready for the fight and those critical hold elements there. So it's not combat? No, there, this isn't 2004 when I was here the first time. We're not shoulder to shoulder on the front lines. We're, we're enabling them. Uh, not, they are leading this fight. And yet we're seeing American service members out there very close to the action and in some cases losing their lives. Well, this is, this is a dangerous environment that we're in. So, you know, my number one uh, priority is force protection and protecting all those servicemen and women that are there. I mean, the problem is that when ISIS first blitzed across northern Iraq two years ago, a lot of members of the Iraqi military ran away. What's to stop that happening again? Well, if you look at what we were training on the Iraq, uh, the Iraqi security forces at that time, it was more counterinsurgency. I mean, that was what they were trained for. We have been training them on this type of fight, this decisive action fight, more conventional over the last you know, period of time for months and months. And so they've also built uh, confidence as they've gone. Every step they take uh, against Dash and defeat Dash is like a drumbeat, and that drumbeat's getting louder and louder as it gets to Mosul. So Iraq, so the Iraqi military wasn't ready for ISIS then, but it is now? Well, I wasn't here when they, when they, in 2014. I'm here now, and they are, they are ready to go take Mosul. In Iraq, dozens of people have been killed following multiple attacks in Baghdad and across the country. 
The deadliest blast took place in the north of the Iraqi capital when a suicide bomber targeted a funeral tent, which was also filled with people taking part in the Shiite Ashura ritual. At least 41 people were killed and scores injured. ISIL claimed responsibility for that attack. The escalation in violence comes as Iraqi forces continue to prepare for a major operation to retake the northern Iraqi city of Mosul. Elsewhere in Iraq, eight people were killed by a suicide blast on a police station in Tikrit, while the wife and three children of a local commander in Ishaki district were also shot dead by militants. Floodwaters from Hurricane Matthew are moving downstream in the U.S. state of North Carolina, drowning towns and farms. And it's not just the water levels that are dangerous, but also what they're carrying, toxins and bacteria from animal waste. Rob Reynolds reports from Kinston in North Carolina. Seen from above the flooded farm fields of North Carolina, they are dotted with hundreds of industrial-scale pig and poultry raising operations identifiable by rows of long white metal sheds. These factory farms produce millions of hogs, and the hogs produce 37 billion liters of fecal matter every year. The waste is stored in giant open cesspools. Now, floodwaters have breached many of those waste lagoons, sending a tide of filth downstream. Environmentalists say the farms should never have been built in potential flood zones. Hurricane Matthew was a natural disaster, but what we're seeing now is a man-made catastrophe, the result of highly industrialized, factory-scale farming and livestock production. We've been advising people not to expose themselves to the waters because of all the bacteria that propagates in these hog lagoons that's now in our waterways and not to mention all the stormwater runoff, the uh, heavy metals. We've seen, um, we've seen gas stations and fuel storage facilities underwater. You know, right now we've got a toxic soup that is flowing through our waterways. Besides posing a danger to humans, the polluted water will likely kill aquatic life, endanger fisheries, and create dead zones in North Carolina's shallow bays and estuaries. Governor Pat McCrory says the floods have killed more than two dozen people in the state and made thousands homeless. It's the poorest of the poor, many people who cannot afford um, this type of disaster to hit their family. It's hit. Kinston, population 22,000, is underwater. The only traffic on its main street is National Guard trucks bringing relief and rescuing stranded residents. In most of Kinston's submerged neighborhoods, residents had little time to flee. The night I come out, the rescue squad got me. I grabbed a suitcase, threw some clothes in it, and that's it. He's not sure whether he'll go back. I might have to go find me some higher land and move because I'm not going to go through this again. Misery that continues long after the storm has passed. Rob Reynolds, Al Jazeera, Kinston, North Carolina.